Hi folks, welcome back to the Cannabis Corner. I'm your host, Kerry Burns. When our country first began, we hemp growing and cannabis smoking was the mainstay in, in many of the parts of the colonies and stuff. And as we progress through time, uh, you know, during the middle parts of the 1800s, 1850s, in that era and all, we saw huge, 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 huge operations growing hemp in this country. And it was a, it was a big deal. It, was, it employed a lot of people. Uh, many, many products that we were able to offer up for sale, not only in trade among the local people, but nationally and also internationally. So this, you know, this type of industry that we had set, and it was a very simple one, even with the crude material and, ma and machines and stuff that we had to operate with back then, we still were able to produce a very viable product and an industry that really had a big impact on the economy and what was going on back in the early days of our founding here in this country. And uh, unfortunately, though, we, we all know the history as we rolled into the 30s after the Depression and all, and the powers that be uh, sold out to the, pretty much to the people who were controlling all the money and all. And uh, we were able to get the uh, campaign against hemp started, which was a very tragic mistake for this country. And uh, it has had nothing but down, down repercussions ever since. Of course, we all know that uh, Anslinger, Harry Anslinger, he was the first uh, so-called drug czar, and uh, he, being the nephew of Andrew Mellon and all, he really was uh, out of out of work. He he used to run the board that controlled alcohol, and once they made alcohol legal, he didn't have a job, and uh, they they saw this uh, chance of him to become a drug czar, and uh, but they had to do one thing: they had to make hemp illegal. And uh, there was really no foundation for it. We all know that. We've people who have smoked for decades and decades with no health issues and no visits to the doctor, no visits to the hospital for anything, any kind of ailments or anything as a result from it. And certainly during the early time in this country, up up through the time when they passed the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937, there weren't people going to the hospital and getting sick or, or children dying or anything like that. And believe me, they were taking dosages that from a today from a smoker's standpoint of today were, were quite quite strong. And uh, that's uh, pretty much a uh, good clinical trial, if you will, for amongst the public. And particularly in the fact that we that a lot of this was being prescribed to children for, for many different ailments. Uh, cannabis you know, there's many known ailments that it treats, and uh, but there were many, many things that that cannabis was prescribed for that uh, really aren't written in medical books or anything like that. These were pretty much herbal approaches, and the reason that was is because cannabis is an herb. And uh, our government briefly came back to life a little bit during World War II when we came up with the Hemp for Victory campaign because we realized not only how important the uh, hemp material was, and certainly it was important in our efforts in the war and all, particularly with our naval ships and the ropes and the uniforms and stuff like that, but also as a commodity, as a way to keep farmers busy, as a way to bring about revenues for them. And, and when you bring about revenues on the farm, this spreads out into the communities and all the different businesses and stuff. So our government briefly woke up in the 40s. And then uh, I guess Harry Anslinger around the early 1960s started to get a little bit bored and probably felt the uh, pressure of the public, of the outcry of people wondering why cannabis was still illegal and when really there weren't people dropping over dead, all the stupid little movies they had made back in the 30s and, and the late part of the 30s on, on how dangerous it was and how people were dying and blacks were raping women and the Mexicans were taking over and it was because they were smoking marijuana. And, and I mean, it just it got to absurdity over and over and over and over. And uh, apparently Harry Anslinger himself was feeling the threat of it. So he attends this uh, Singles Narcotics Convention Treaty in 1960. And prior to that point, the international uh, body had no control over cannabis. So they pretty much looked at it as an herb, which it is. And of course, Anslinger and the strong arm of the United States government, we allowed cannabis to be placed in the Singles Narcotics Treaty. And this pretty much laid the foundation for what was to come when Nixon came into office with his Controlled Substance Act and the formation of the Drug Enforcement Agency. Of course, we all know what repercussions that has brought about. I mean, not only the arrest and, and lockup of millions and millions of people, innocent lives that have been ruined because they decided to use a safe approach and use an herb that up until that point in time had never been deemed unsafe. 
the government, it seems like, was the only one that was running campaigns that was trying to show that it was unsafe. And and, and we got to look at the fact, too, that uh, Nixon, you know, he's the president that came up with this. And we all know how he left office. It was a shame. It was the, the White House was shamed. The entire political process was shamed. I mean, if you want to really go back in history and all, he was a pretty evil president. And I think personally that this Controlled Substance Act that was penned under his reign and also the formation of the Drug Enforcement Agency, both of these acts were, were wrong. And, and when you look at the fact that a, a heinous president like Nixon is the one that came up with them, why, why are we having so much trouble removing them from our society? Because we know for a fact that the formation of the Drug Enforcement Agency has done nothing to stop the flow of drugs into this country. It has done nothing but increase the murders and the violence and the formation of all the drug cartels and stuff that we have seen form since the beginning of the 1970s. This is when all of those started taking root. We did not have these before the formation of the Drug Enforcement Agency. We did not have all of this before the Controlled Substance Act. This all came about because we gave the illegal market a chance to flourish, just like we did in the days of Prohibition with the Capone gangs and all the alcohol and stuff. Here we are, we've opened up an avenue for people to make money illegally and make it exorbitantly, not just, you know, a little bit. They were, you know, it was tremendous profits they were making. And the more money they made, the more powerful they got. The more powerful they got, the more they refused the control of the government, the more they've refused the control of everything going on, and this is when the violence began. And I'm sorry, but the Drug Enforcement Agency is the reason that we see the violence that we're seeing across the border. Now, what, with all of this going on, and we know for a fact that nobody's ever died from an overdose of cannabis, we know nobody's ever been to the hospital and all, what justification does our government have in keeping cannabis illegal? We, we, all, we've, we know all about the brain chemistry of cannabis. We actually know for a fact that it's extremely beneficial. If there are some detrimental side effects of it, none have been shown up in any type of research or anything, reason being because there may have been some minor issues that, that happen when you're smoking cannabis, but they're so minor, I mean, they're not even worth mentioning. And this is why we haven't had any type of, of negative feedback from it, because there isn't any. Scientific research has shown just the opposite. But all through this period, though, the Drug Enforcement Agency, which is the one that controls the decision whether or not we take it off controlled substance or not, they've, they've just kept using the same excuse over and over and over and over, over and over. We need more scientific and medical evaluation. We don't. We have 50 million people using cannabis daily in this country, probably more. And because there are many, many people that smoke that, that would, if they were in part of an opinion poll or something, they would probably say no for fear of losing their job, being drug tested or some sort of thing like that. So we really don't even have an accurate count other than the ones that outwardly admitted that they are cannabis users. And, and the very fact that none of these people have gone to the hospital for an overdose, not one, I mean, you can't even come up with one case, one submitted overdose into a hospital. How can we satisfy the criterion of the Controlled Substance Act which says that it's, that it's mainly there to keep, to keep from harming the public. How are we harming the public? How in the world are, is cannabis harming the public? Most of the people who smoke cannabis, they use it in the privacy of their own home. And even if they were out on the street smoking a joint, they're not the type that do violent crime. They don't go out and steal. They don't go out and beat people over the head for money so they can buy their cannabis. None of that happens. M most of them would like to grow their own and not even have to deal with the street gangs or anything to procure their, their cannabis. But in some of the big cities and places like that, they have no choice. Even smaller towns, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty much widespread that we have to go to an illegal market, and this is wrong. And we want to... Uh, what we're going to do is, is let this be part of a three-part series in which we're going to address every angle from the cannabis from the beginning up to the present day and show that there is no legal basis for having cannabis illegal. And we're going to use this to approach our congressmen. We're going to approach our lawmakers and stuff and ask them why. What legal right do you have? 
What constitutional right do you have? This is about freedom of choice. It's always been about freedom of choice. And what right do you have on any level, in any form of government, in any form of any law-abiding body, have the right to tell me that I cannot use an herb that I know is safe for me and medicinally beneficial to me, socially beneficial to me, and it's my choice. How do you have the right to tell me otherwise, let alone make up a law that threatens my very existence and threatens me going to jail? It's just wrong. And I thank you for spending time in the cannabis corner.